Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, our speaker today is Greg Morissette, the Dean of Computing and Information Science here at Cornell. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us on this webinar. I've never done one of these before, but uh, you'd think somebody who works in computing and information science would know something about doing webinars. We'll see. Um, uh, throughout this presentation, I'm, I just want to tell you a little bit about computing and information science at Cornell, what we're doing, what we're up to. Uh, but if you have questions, feel free to type them in and we'll try to respond to them uh, as we can. So let's get started. Uh, the first question anybody asks me is, what is CIS? What is Computing and Information Science? Um, it's a unit of faculty, like a school, that consists of depart three departments. One of them is Computer Science, one of them is Statistical Science, and one of them is Information Science. And as a whole, they deal with data computation, information networks, and essentially the modern information society. Um, computer science classically deals with a number of core issues like algorithms and systems, languages, security, et cetera. Um, and we have real strength there. The, the department dates back to well over 50, uh, 50 years ago. Information science is a newer department that started only about uh, 10, 11 years ago. Um, with an emphasis on the sort of people side of technology and society. So everything from human-computer interaction to uh, computational sustainability or natural language processing, information retrieval, these are the kinds of topics that faculty and students in information science study. Then in statistics, uh, you know, it's a, it's surprisingly, that's the newest department uh, in CIS. And uh, they focus, of course, on statistical science, it's probability statistics, but also uh, more recent topics like machine learning, which has a strong overlap and a strong connection with computer science. Um, there's also really good connections with other units on campus uh, uh, through statistical science, and in particular uh, biology as well as uh, economics and uh, the ILR school, industrial and labor relations. So in fact, CIS as a whole, as a unit, is tasked with connecting across all of campus. And of course, as you all know, Cornell is huge and it's so varied and diverse that there are many, many different areas that we might partner with. And these are just some of those that we have an engagement with. For example, information science and uh, social scientists, particularly in economics and sociology, study human networks like social networks uh, or uh, other kinds of uh, uh, feeds that we might have, for example, uh, Twitter feeds and try to extract information from them. Uh, then even in the areas, of course, like the physical sciences, like physics and chemistry and mathematics, we have strong overlap with both computer science and statistical sciences. But these days, even things like precision agriculture, where robotics are going in to really remake the way that we, uh, we do farming, has a big overlap. So uh, one of the things that I'm most excited about in being here at Cornell is the breadth and the depth across the whole university and the potential for computer and information sciences to impact every field. Um, a lot of people also ask me, what are sort of the characteristics of Cornell's CIS compared to other institutions who have a real presence in, in these fields? And one of the most important is that uh, we really have a big focus on foundations and, and a really strong, rigorous academic program. And that really dates back to the founding of the department with people like Eurus Hartmanis, who's pictured up here. Uh, Eurus uh, is the inventor of computational complexity. Uh, he's really founded the whole field of theoretical computer science. But these days we have people like John Kleinberg who are also well known. He, he formulated the first uh, major algorithm that supported search the way that Google does it for all of us today. He also uh, invented algorithms that allow you to, for instance, uh, see your Facebook feed uh, every morning. So. Uh, foundations is, is really something that we're known for the most. We're also, as suggested by the previous slide, really interdisciplinary with a goal of not being another silo or another unit on campus that's separated, but rather something that connects to everything. Also with the rise of, in particular, the new Cornell Tech Campus, which I'll talk about in a, in a bit, this is one of the most entrepreneurial spaces that you can, can get into. Uh, the entree into the New York tech market for the Cornell campus is a big step and a really exciting uh, move for us. It really is important to attract the very best students to have that kind of uh, uh, service. Another thing that distinguishes us, I think, from many other institutions is a focus that we, while we're entrepreneurial and we want to build businesses and, uh, and, and go after things that you'll find in, in the whole tech industry, most of our students have a real commitment to 
to service to society. They really want to go out and, and have impact, but impact in a way that will help society. And finally, one of the things that I like the, the most about this place is that it's very collegial at all levels. The students love each other, the faculty, the staff, we all work together. Um, so one of the reasons that this uh, area is so exciting is that we, we really end up revolutionizing fields whenever we come in contact with them. So a good example is social science. There's a real revolution happening in social sciences, be it psychology, be it sociology, just because computer science allows you to scale out. So for example, we can run experiments on platforms like Amazon's Mechanical Turk, or we can mine information from Twitter and Facebook feeds in order to, to figure out sociological trends that we just couldn't see at that, that kind of scale. Another example is even in areas like uh, the biological sciences, social computing uh, is something that's revolutionizing those fields. Those of, many of you, if you're like me, are, are a big fan of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, and they really depend upon citizen scientists to help them with uh, uh, collecting information about birds and their migration patterns. And there are other examples of this, like the World Wide Web Telescope or uh, the University of Washington has a really great project on how to do uh, protein folding uh, as a game. And again, you're just in engaging with humans, so we're using humans as much to do these interesting computational tasks, but coordinated by computers. And these days, there's excitement in fields like education. You, you hear about MOOCs all the time. Uh, and, and computer scientists and information scientists, statisticians are trying to get together to uh, see if we can push education out to a much broader audience than the folks that we just have on campus, but also revolutionize how we're teaching on campus. So I think uh, computer science manages to touch on just about any field, and uh, whenever we do come in contact with it, we tend to shake it up and, and revolutionize it. But as a field, we also introduce lots of headaches. So uh, it was in the building right next door to me, Upson Hall, back in uh, when I was a graduate student that the first internet worm was released. Uh, and at that time, we didn't have many computers. Only about 6,000 were on the internet. But, uh, uh, and breaking into them was more of a prank than anything. These days, of course, we have to contend with criminals, cyber criminals who are spread around the world, breaking into systems, trying to steal personal information or uh, hack systems. And you have nation states. You know, you have uh, uh, real issues with uh, rogue states as well as terrorist organizations trying to break into and, and own systems. And that gives rise to many technical challenges. How can we secure systems? But we can't just address these problems at a technical level. We also have to engage on economic, social, policy, and law level. And again, having a, a unit that reaches out and connects to uh, the broader campus is important for addressing this hard societal problem. Another issue is uh, while all the new uh, tech companies like Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn uh, uh, are focused on data, they really derive, uh, in some ways, you're the product, right? That your information is how they derive value. Um, that's like the new oil, that finding big sources of data is really useful, really important, but it's also something where we have to worry about uh, privacy leaks and the impact that uh, all this data floating around in a digital form uh, can have. There's also something that I'm uh, worried about. I see a growing social and economic division, in part because of the tech industry. So we see the rise of uh, services like Uber uh, that are displacing jobs that, uh, that are sort of traditional. And as we have AI and uh, artificial intelligence and robotics come online, that will also have a big major disruption on uh, the sort of workforce. So is this a field that creates or destroys jobs? And that's something that, uh, again, gets back to our point about service and to society, that we really want to do the, the right things in the long run. Um, within CIS, it's also important, uh, in addition to the traditional subjects, there's some uh, specific subjects that are, oh, the door just blew open. Uh, there's some specific subjects that we have a particular focus on right now. So these include things like computational sustainability, uh, cryptocurrency and contracts, and so forth. And you can, you can look down the list. This is not a complete list by any stretch of the imagination. It was just some of the topics that I thought I would call to give you an idea of what faculty and students are working on these days. Um, and I'll go into a few examples of these. One of these is, is a field called computational sustainability. This was really started at Cornell about um, six, seven years ago. 
Uh, and it got kicked off by a big NSF uh, grant to the tune of about $10 million for a five-year program. The idea is to bring techniques from uh, algorithmic optimization, machine learning, artificial intelligence, as well as uh, human crowdsourcing and other social platforms to bear on hard scientific problems that uh, affect sustainability. So this includes things like conservation and biodiversity. We have a, a, a joint project with uh, Ecuador to help uh, manage their biodiversity, uh, to balancing uh, various soci socioeconomic needs. And a good example is weather prediction in, uh, in Africa, where it turns out it's very hard to, uh, to get good, accurate data about, for example, uh, rainfall, and to allow farmers to predict accurately when's a good time to go graze over in this area of the country as opposed to that area. So we're able to, to leverage crowdsourcing with cell phones from uh, farmers around the nation in order to, to build better models and to do more accurate prediction. And most recently, Carla and uh, Bart Selman have just gotten a brand new NSF uh, expedition award. Again, another $10 million big project. And they're focusing on things like uh, helping the great material science group here in engineering uh, find new energy, uh, uh, new efficient uh, store, uh, new, new efficient materials for storing energy. Um, and in fact, they were able to cut down the search for uh, optimizing a particular kind of um, uh, material approach uh, by an order of magnitude. So it's a, it's a really interesting and exciting field. We have many students connected to it from all around campus, um, and it's, it's a good example of Cornell and computer information science. Another good example is uh, the work by Ari Jules, uh, Andrew Myers, Elaine Shi, uh, and uh, Gun Surir, amongst others, on the, the interface between cryptography, which is sort of a classic security field, and uh, currencies or contracts. So uh, many of you have probably heard about Bitcoin. It's a, it sounds like an exciting new cryptocurrency. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's also, I mean, one of the advantages of it is that it allows us to get rid of a centralized bank uh, and allows to do transfers in a, in a, in a more offline fashion. And, and the underlying cryptography is really enabling for a broader class of transactions uh, that, that could help with a number of things. Of course, there are many problems with these kinds of cryptocurrencies as well. For example, criminal organizations love this because it's anonymous. Um, and another issue is that um, at least Bitcoin is actually subject to uh, certain market pressure, certain economic concerns that uh, make it possible to sort of corner the market. Uh, and that kind of detailed analysis was actually first put forth by, by Gun Sarir, one of our faculty. And so he and Elaine and others are crafting new forms of cryptocurrency and contracts that address some of these hard problems, like can you corner the market? We want to make sure you provably can't. But at the same time, we want to um, ensure the privacy of individuals or the right kinds of security concerns so that, for example, law enforcement can go after bad guys. Um, another example, and, and I'm just picking three that are sort of at random here, but, but I, I thought they were pretty exciting, uh, is, is our innovation going on in the classroom connecting the arts, uh, and in particular, history and literature to computer science. So this is a class that David Mimno is teaching or taught last semester on text mining for history and literature. And the idea is now with projects like Google's Books Project or other online repositories, we have lots and lots of historical texts in a digital form. Can we run algorithms over those texts to extract interesting information about language or history or literature going forward. And that's what David's course is about. It has a mix of technical people, but also English PhD students in there. So it's a very exciting example of the breadth and, uh, and the reach of this field as we go across uh, the campus. So uh, let, me, let me step back a little bit and tell you, uh, especially for the alumni here who may be familiar with what's going on, some of the challenges and opportunities that computer and information sciences at, at Cornell face right now. The biggest uh, challenge, but also maybe the most exciting thing, is the growth in enrollment. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Another issue is the relationships with other units, always managing that, and in particular with uh, Cornell Tech that's just come online. I'll also mention diversity, which I think is a particular challenge in the field as a whole, but something that, that I've committed to focusing on. And then engagement both with alumni and industry. One of the reasons I'm doing this webinar is just to reach out and give you guys an update of what's going on here.
So here's, here's a graph that shows uh, the growth in enrollment between the year 2000 uh, and, and the current day, uh, 2016. In fact, these numbers are from last semester, so I don't know exactly what the numbers are for this current semester. But what you see is this increasing growth from around uh, sort of a low after the dot-com bust of about 3,500 enrollment hours up to over 12,000 enrollment hours now uh, by our students. And the thing to keep in mind is about half of the undergrads at Cornell are taking a class in CIS now. Um, maybe more remarkable to me is the growth in the number of majors in computer information science and statistical sciences. So this graph only shows the growth uh, from 2000 up through 2015. And again, you can sort of see the drop off from the dot com bust. Uh, but then you see this meteoric rise as we uh, uh, come to the present day. And in fact, just yesterday I ran some new numbers and see that we have over a thousand majors uh, in CIS. Um, so this is just explosive growth. And, and an interesting fact is we're actually teaching this number of students with roughly the same size faculty in computer science that we had back in 2000. So uh, one of the big things that I need to work on and, and we're working on as, as best we can is to grow the faculty to meet this student demand. Every student has figured out that this field, even if they're not going to major in it, will play an important role in whatever they're going to do, be it history and literature or uh, the physical sciences or economics or business. So given that growth, scaling the faculty and staff to meet the student demand is important. And with that comes other uh, 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 key scaling issues like trying to find the right space for all these people. Uh, classroom space is becoming a limiting factor. John Kleinberg teaches a great class on network science that has 700 students in it. Uh, why does it have 700 students in it? Because we can't find a classroom bigger than holding 700 students. Uh, and it's also available online on edX. So actually, he's got thousands and thousands of students taking that class. Um, one of the challenges in growing like this is right now, this field is so hot that there's intense competition with industry and with other schools. And of course, the startup scene is really exciting and really hot right now. So other schools are also seeing big enrollment growth, maybe not quite as big as ours. Um, but uh, the demand for new faculty is, is really intense. And so we're out there uh, interviewing as many faculty candidates as we can and trying to bring people in, uh, instructors and other things. But we want to maintain the quality and the standards that Cornell has always been known for. So that's a real challenge for us. Um, we have been successful in hiring the last couple of years. So these are some new hires that we, that we brought in last year. Um, I'll just point out a couple of them. Uh, Karen Levy will be joining us in the fall. She'll be joining information science. She's actually uh, trained in a combination of law and technical policy. So I mentioned, for example, cybersecurity really needs people who have backgrounds, not just in technical fields, but also in policy and law. And she's an example of somebody like that. Another instance is Killian Weinberger, who came from the uh, University of Washington in St. Louis. He's an expert in machine learning. Machine learning is, of course, one of the hottest fields in computer science now. Killian is one of the very best people in the field, and I was really glad to grab him. Elaine Shi, I mentioned her earlier. She's an expert in cryptography, in particular applied cryptography, and we managed to convince her to come here from the University of Maryland. So uh, these are all great people, and we're thrilled to have them. And that's just the people in Ithaca. We also hired a number of people down in New York City. Uh, Tom Ristenpark came from the University of Wisconsin. He's also a, an expert in applied security. Uh, Nikki Dell will be joining us. Actually, she just joined us this month uh, from the University of Washington, and her expertise is in tech for the emerging world. So in particular, she's focused on health outcomes and how can you affect them using technology in the emerging world. UF Artsy is another great uh, machine learning person, but he works on natural language processing. It's again another strength that we have here at Cornell with a number of key people. These hires at Cornell Tech are people that we consider part of our own. They're not, it's not a separate department, uh, separate departments, rather we're a big faculty that spans two campuses now. Um, so regarding space for all these people, well, uh, if you haven't been to campus lately, you should come by and check out the new Gates Hall building. It's only a couple of years old. It's a beautiful building right in the heart of campus, right off, right next to the baseball field. Um, and it's a beautiful, very functional, but beautiful building. The, the key component is there's a coffee shop on the ground floor. And believe me, the, uh, we all need our caffeine. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good one. 
Um, but it's, believe it or not, uh, with the kind of growth that we're seeing with the students, uh, the demand is such that we're already thinking about how can we expand the space that, we, that we're occupying. And other units, uh, components like the Department of Statistical Sciences is spread across another site. So we're trying to think about how best to programmatically bring these people together and how can we support that kind of growth that is being demanded from the students. Um, so I mentioned engagement with other, other units and Cornell Tech is the, the other thing that everybody always asks me about. This is of course the most exciting uh, 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 development I think in, in Cornell's his, in recent history. It's a brand new campus down in New York City with an emphasis on technology, but it spans many different departments, so including computer science, information science, but now we also have programs in law coming online as well as, of course, business. Uh, CIS actually has the most faculty down there right now, and we're the most engaged with it. Our PhD students, for example, come in and do a, a year's worth of coursework here in Ithaca, and then if they choose to work with one of the faculty who are housed down in New York City, then they'll go down there and work with them. Uh, we have a lot of innovative master's programs going on there that mix people across fields in, for example, an open studio environment. That's been so successful, mixing, for example, business students with technical students, uh, that we're importing some of these ideas back up here. And I, I see Cornell Tech as a great place for innovating, for trying new ideas out, and bringing really good ideas back here to campus uh, here in Ithaca. But of course, Cornell Tech isn't the only game in town for us. Uh, we're, we're springing up new engagements with arts and sciences, as I, I mentioned, business on campus here, and even the, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. So uh, these, are, these are all growth areas for us, but we'll always maintain a really strong connection to engineering, which is sort of our, our home. Um, another key challenge for me, and I think for computer science in general across the nation, is, uh, is diversity. So in particular, if you look at the number of women who are majoring in computer science at major uh, research universities across the U.S., get, the percentage is actually pretty dreadful. It's about 12 percent. Okay, this is, this is ridiculous. Uh, we're driving women away and, and something needs to be done about it. Fortunately, uh, the situation in, at Cornell is much better. Unfortunately, the numbers are much worse for women of color or, in fact, uh, men of color. So uh, this, is a, this is a big challenge for us is to, to, to increase our diversity. Those are the national averages. At Cornell, diversity is, is much better. In particular, within engineering, this year, uh, the incoming class was roughly half women. And that's a remarkable achievement. Uh, I don't know of any other engineering school that's even come close to that. Um, and almost 20% were underrepresented minorities. This, so Lance Collins, the Dean of Engineering, has really done a marvelous job working with the team to increase diversity there. But computer science is still lagging. We're uh, about 27% women and about 8.5% underrepresented minorities. So we're doing well above the national average, but we can do a lot better. And there are a number of initiatives that we've uh, kicked off to try to, uh, to increase diversity within our own, own ranks. So one was the introduction of information sciences. That's something that's appealed much more to a broader class of students. Uh, another is the, the creation of a group called Women in Computing at Cornell, and they do a number of exciting activities uh, uh, to foster a community uh, on campus. <coughs> We've also it, undertaken an, an engagement with the National Center for Women in IT. Uh, they're kind of come here and help instrument our courses to understand where we might be losing women or underrepresented minorities. And finally, uh, we have some new summer programs to help encourage people from underrepresented groups to, to look at computer science and just try to increase the, the pipeline and the flow and get them engaged with research early on. Um, speaking of engagement, uh, most of you, if you're alumni, have graduated from a different college than CIS. You graduated maybe from engineering or from arts. CS, computer science, was the only department back in the old days that sat between those two schools and, and drew majors from both colleges. Now uh, uh, we have the challenge of convincing or, or telling alumni about this new unit on campus and its relationship to the rest of the world. That's part of the reason I'm, I'm engaging in this webinar today. Um, but there's a lot of confusion when I go talk to faculty, to, to alumni around the world about what is CIS, what's its relationship to other units like Cornell Tech. And uh, so we need your help getting the word out and explaining exactly what we are. I could also uh, 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 beg you to, uh, to like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. We even have a YouTube channel which 
show some of the really interesting students and other uh, faculty that are going on on, on campus to, to help keep people engaged. But I need your help in getting the word out. Appreciate it. So I'll stop there uh, and uh, thank you for your attention, your, your time. But uh, if you have questions, now's a good chance to, uh, to shoot them at me. Okay, so uh, we'll start with the first question that we have from online. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the CIS cross-campus collaboration and future plans for the, the college? Sure, cross-campus. Um, so one of the biggest collaborations that we're springing up right now is with arts and sciences in the realm of social sciences. So we have real expertise in information science and computer science in areas around, uh, uh, for example, sociology and economics. And that's something that both Dean Ritter from Arts and Sciences and I have, have committed to investing in. We had a wonderful uh, workshop where we brought in leading people from industry, including places like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Yahoo, as well as faculty from a number of institutions. This is something that Cornell really leads in, and I think that will be a, a, a big effort going forward. So that's one example of a cross-campus uh, collaboration. Another one is in the realm of robotics meets, meets agriculture. So we're just starting this and thinking about uh, how uh, computer and information sciences can help the researchers in, in various areas, in CALS, focus on agriculture, food supply, and food security. These are things that are extremely important for the nation and the world. Um, so that's something that, again, we want to get involved with and, and help with. So I hope that answers your question. Great. Can you talk about interactions with the public sector? The public sector, sure. Um, so there are many different aspects of the public sector. So there's out, outside engagement. For example, the Statistical Sciences Unit has a, a statistical consulting unit that is uh, tasked with helping people around New York State set up and model various problems that they may have um, and, uh, and find solutions to them. Another example is we have faculty like Fred Schneider in computer science who serves on various national boards and has testified in front of Congress. He's an expert on cybersecurity and uh, somebody that I always turn to uh, when I have questions about that particular field. Um, and of course, faculty are engaged on a number of projects like these sustainability efforts that are really aimed at, at addressing uh, public uh, concerns. So again, I hope that answers your question. Great. Can you tell us what you think the next Facebook will be? What will be the next Facebook? That's a good question. I, could, I should ask you guys. You, you might know better than me. But I think there are some fields that we can see right away that are, are accelerating so quickly, and they've just about reached their peak. A good example is in augmented and virtual reality. So we're seeing the first headsets from places like Oculus Rift, but I think it's really when we see devices like Microsoft's HoloLens uh, uh, and sort of next generation Google Glasses and so forth that we can have a replacement for the cell phone. It's something that will change us as much as smartphones have changed our lives today. Um, and, and so I think that's one of the most exciting fields. And again, we're a leader. In fact, Don Greenberg, who many of you may know, is, is teaching a class on virtual and augmented reality just this semester. So that's one area where I think we could see another Facebook-like or Apple-like company uh, emerge. Another one is, of course, the rise in machine learning and artificial intelligence is really taking off these days. Um, and there are lots and lots of startups and companies in various sectors focused on machine learning uh, and techniques for doing that. Um, a lot of that is low-hanging fruit right now. If somebody can pull together the right set of services, the right uh, sort of uh, economic model for sustaining that, then they could be as big as uh, Microsoft. Can you talk a little bit about interaction with China? With China? Oh, that's a good question. So we, we have a, an, an exchange program with Shanghai Jiao Tong University, um, where we brought in some students from that university to work on research projects and do uh, abbreviated coursework over the summer. John Hopcroft one of our most distinguished faculty and former dean of engineering, uh, has been, in fact, he told me just yesterday, he was invited by the premier of China to come over and to help consult with uh, uh, higher education in China. So he's very interested in engaging 
with a number of universities around, uh, including Tsinghua, but also Shanghai, and of course uh, universities in, in Hong Kong. So um, that's another example of, of the kind of engagement that we have. We of course have a number of students from China. Uh, in fact, a number of our master's students and PhD students are coming from Chinese universities. It's actually you know, a, a pretty multicultural uh, world when you come back here to Ithaca. Great. Can you give us a sense of how CIS would like to work with companies and industry? How would comp CIS like to work with companies and industry? Well, part of the reason for opening the New York Tech campus is this gives us a real entree to a really exciting startup scene. So that's one aspect of it. But one of the others is that, um, uh, again, raising the awareness about the good things that are going on in CIS. Uh, I I'm uh, trying to push together some industrial affiliates programs focused around particular topics that I think industry is very interested in. These need to be forward-looking topics that uh, we have particular expertise in and, and can draw not just from computer and information science but around the campus. So a good, good example is the work on, on computational social science. So many companies are interested in extracting information from all of the documents and mail and messages that they have in order to optimize processes or to connect the right people to the right things. And we have the right, the right people to work on that sort of, sort of problem. Another example would be setting up markets uh, that have the right computational flavor, the right incentives, uh, but that can be executed in, in real time. Um, and uh, so again, combining economics and computer science is a, is a big part of that. So those are, those are examples, but uh, we could probably come up with others. Great, so we have a couple folks uh, with their hand raised, so we're gonna try and uh, take some questions from the phone. Joel Zumoff, uh, do you have a question? Okay. Hello. How about John, John Burke? Yes, hello, uh, John Burke calling from Cleveland. I was wondering, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, I was wondering uh, what opportunities are there f uh, in your graduate school for uh, those in industry to take courses maybe online, uh, as a preliminary to maybe application to the graduate school, mm -hmm. or my son is uh, works in information sciences, and I'd, I'd certainly like to plug him into the opportunities at Cornell. Uh, and uh, so, if you can talk about that, thank you. It's a great question. We, through eCornell and edX, offer a few courses, but Cornell has not jumped into this the same way that some other institutions have. Part of that is the big demand that we already have on campus, both campuses, Ithaca and New York, uh, for computer science classes, um, uh, computer and information science classes. So it's something that we're considering, and but beyond the few courses that we have, for example, on edX, uh, there's not a lot of great options within Cornell, and that's something that we need to work on. Okay. Bill Gilmore, did you have a question? We'll go to a uh, chat box question. Are there mechanisms for companies to license IP from CIS or to collaborate with professors on specific programs? Yeah, so the question about IP is a good one. Uh, this is something that's getting revisited in part because, especially with the, the opening of the tech campus, where students are engaged with companies coming in with problems or questions that they want the students to wrestle with, uh, we have to face these IP issues right up front. And so, yes, the answer is, uh, both in terms of students and faculty spinning out startups, there are new sort of IP procedures in place that I think are much more flexible that allow Cornell to actually do the innovation that some of the previous policies might have prevented. Um, at the same time, the collaboration with other companies, uh, we're starting to, to iron out some of the wrinkles that have happened and have prevented the collaboration that, that ought to happen. So I think, again, like I said, Cornell Tech is really uh, a great place for us to try ideas out and innovate, and with our partners from uh, Technion, who are really experts at, at this kind of thing, 
we're figuring out uh, new policies and procedures. Some of that has been slow to get back up here in Ithaca, and I would like to see more action on that. The new president and the new provost have promised that this is something that they would like to streamline as well. Great. Jack Rohr, did you have a question? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, I just was same sort of question. Uh, I'm, I have a small business uh, automation approach, and we have a different uh, approach to engage, employing a computer when you automate. You don't need to design and develop a system ahead of time. Question, who might I work with? Who might we work with uh, in the CIS area? Uh, I would need to know a little bit more to understand who you might connect with. Uh, uh, so can you say a little bit more? Is this design automation or is this? Well, this is essentially, I believe, ready to be implemented, but um, what it is, yeah, I said a different approach. Uh, if the if it, you could get the background and orientation information, you don't think about orientation, orientation information into a computer, Mm -hmm. then this approach allows you to direct it as you might direct a person who had that orientation and background information. In other words, you don't have to decide, design an upfront uh, system. I think the big usefulness here is in organizations where these enormous enterprise systems and even smaller systems are unwieldy and they don't, they don't stay with a rapidly changing world. They, they hang back. This one allows a manager to direct the computer. Uh-huh. Yeah, so this, I mean, this is a sort of a long-standing dream, right, is to be able to interface and talk with computers in a way that get them to do things in a natural way that uh, is, is more conducive to the way humans work. So generally, the, the folks in, in, in working in artificial intelligence uh, and planning, decision-making, uh, people like Killian Weinberger, but also people like Claire Cardi, Lillian Lee, uh, uh, who else? Uh, 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 Christian Danilescu. I can't say Christian's last name because it's three names and it's Romanian and it's too long for me to know. Um, but a great example is just perusing the AI uh, sort of subpage under Computer and Information Sciences. You can find a number of faculty who, who might be a good fit for you. It's still a little hard for me to tell uh, what, what might be the, the right connection to make. But I'm happy to try to facilitate that if you want to shoot me an email. Okay, thanks, Greg. Can CIS seminars be made available to alumni online? Can CIS seminars be made available online? I think they are available online. Um, uh, pardon me? Cornell CAST uh, supports them. Um, there are, uh, you know, weekly colloquia for information science and computer science, uh, usually also for statistical science, uh, and I think all of those are available through that service. Um, but if you, again, if you, if you have a question like that where you need a specific URL or, or pointer, don't hesitate to shoot me an email and I'll be happy to track down the information for you. Thanks. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Department of Information Science? Sure. So the Department of Information Science is relatively new. It's about 10 years old. Uh, it started about the time CIS pulled out from engineering. So the focus is really on the people side of technology. So uh, a good example is work on design for human-computer interaction. So when we uh, design user interfaces, for example, for a phone or for a, a system, we want to understand the thought processes, the cog cognitive processes that humans have in order to make a design that's workable, that's usable. One of the reasons the iPhone is so great is just because it feels so natural. You can hand it to a three-year-old and they know how to, how to work with it. So HCI is an example of the kind of field that information science is concerned with. One of the, uh, an, another example is all the work uh, on natural language processing, understanding human text and the way that we com communicate, um, and mapping that up to higher level information and supporting decision making or planning. These are all areas that, um, again, we need to interface with humans. And I mentioned other examples like crowdsourcing. How do you design a system like uh, the Lab of O's citizen participation in order to extract the most useful information from people? How do you incentivize people to actually go off and take pictures of birds that you need in areas that uh, you don't have? So uh, there are a number of areas like this where studying how humans work 
in conjunction with computers uh, or networking or communications or data, the other things that, that the technologists are concerned with is, is, is really what information science is all about. We have students in information science from a number of different schools, including CALS, arts, and engineering. So undergraduates from all three of those colleges. And uh, there are a number of different tracks focused on different sub-aspects of that sort of information science field. I hope that answers your question. It's, it's I think, one of the most exciting uh, new departments that has arisen at Cornell. There are other schools that have information science programs. They've traditionally grown out of library science and information retrieval as opposed to computer science. One of the reasons I like Cornell's information science program is it's really well grounded in a strong technical sense, but it also has these great connections to the social sciences. Thanks, Greg. Is there any activity for CIS related to climate change? Yes, the work on sustainability is directly focused on climate change. I mean, that that is is one of our you know biggest concerns, I think, as a society, and it's something that I'm happy to say that Carla and her entire group have managed to, to galvanize a number of students. Uh, students also are very concerned with this, right? So they want to take action with it and they want to do that. And there's many things that we can do there, ranging from climate modeling and the sort of uh, simulations that go on in, in sort of physics, meteorology, climatology, down to uh, mitigations that we might uh, try in order to, uh, to slow or reverse some of the changes that are happening. And so that's that's an area that I'm very interested in. I think a number of faculty are, and certainly uh, many of our students are. Great. Can you tell us, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm losing, you, you mentioned that there is good synergy when students majoring in non-CIS take CIS classes. It may be too specific, but what are some areas for mechanical engineers to explore with combined skills in mechanical engineering and CIS? and how could a student plan out his or her courses? Great, so, so yeah, in, in almost all the engineering classes, uh, uh, disciplines, I would say, uh, of course, having some basic programming is essentially necessary these days, right? A, a mechanical engineer, for example, is interacting with a number of design tools and design automation tools, uh, but also doing a number of important simulations and calculations. So that's one example of a, of a set of classes that I think just about every student on campus should be taking. Another example is the work that we're doing in design uh, and 3D printing and, uh, and so forth. There's a guy named Francois Gumbetier, it's a French name and I can't pronounce French names, I'm sorry. Uh, but Francois's class is really focused on uh, a, a range of topics. Mechi folks may also be very interested in our robotics classes, so people like Ross Nepper, and there are also people in Mechi uh, like Hadas, I forgot Hadas's last name, uh, who are focused on robotics. And, uh, and of course, the mechanical engineers have really uh, stepped up and solved many of the hard interaction and physical problems. How do we automate that? How do we tie that together? That's sort of the computer science coming together. And that's a big growing field. It's something that the Dean of Engineering and I are talking a lot about is how to marry better MECI and the, the work in robotics there with the work in robotics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera, in, in computer and information science. Great, thank you. Um, my daughter is a freshman and is, and is interested in information science. She already took a class this first semester. She'd like to combine, combine information science with art and design and human ecology. Is this possible? Yes. Yeah, that's a great combo, actually. Uh, so uh, 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 there are a lot of ways to do that kind of combination. One way would be to do a minor, for instance, um, in one of the two fields. You could pick one as a major and do the other one as a minor. Um, I think my advice to students is always go where you want to go. Take the classes that you want to take and then let the major follow. Right and uh, or the minors or other things like that. Take the classes. Life is too short. The four years on campus goes by incredibly fast, and there are too many great courses that you want to take. Uh, so don't get wrapped up in too many requirements that may be uh, put on you by trying to, for example, double or triple major or take too many minors or this sort of thing. Just focus, tell her to focus on the classes that she really wants to take and then bend towards whatever uh, uh, program uh, specialization that that fits that. Great. Sustainability is a broad term. Is there any research in collaboration with planetary science on helping reverse climate change? 
there may well be. I, off the top of my head, I don't know uh, examples. A, a good instance might be David Bendel, who works in general on simulation and, and high-performance computing. Of course, when we do climate modeling uh, or uh, these, that kind of big-scale physics simulation, then we need uh, really high-performance computing. So that, that's the closest example that I can think of, but I don't know. I, you have to realize I'm relatively new here. I just got here uh, back in the fall, and I'm still meeting people from all around campus who are connected to CIS in one way or another. Again, I'm happy to track down information for you, though. Thanks, Greg. Okay, so with that, that's the last of our questions. So this will conclude our webinar. Thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you'll be uh, on another webinar with us in the future. Thank you.